Good evening, Church Safety and Security. I am James, one of the Church Safety Guys, and uh, momentarily I will have Paul Buckner join me, and we will talk a little bit about a bunch of different topics tonight. Let's go ahead and see if I can add him in. having a little bit of a challenge with tech this evening. Oh, there he is. Are we there? <laughs> well, I guess it depends on where here is. <laughs> yes. Yes. Because I'm here. <laughs> I am not here. Um, I was trying to get my connection to work and I decided to just turn off my Wi-Fi and go off power and boom, life was good. So cool. for some reason, something was up. <clears throat> All right. So just starting off, um, if you're new, let me, let me do our preamble here real quick. If you're new to the Facebook group or Facebook live, um, and how, how StreamYard works is we actually use it so that we can stream in mul on multiple platforms at the same time. Um, and it also allows allows Paul and I to bring in guests. It works, works pretty well. Um, but when you go into the group, if you click on the live uh, feed, make sure to give StreamYard uh, permission. So when you click on that, it'll pop up and it'll say, uh, do you wish, do you wish to give StreamYard Facebook permission, and, and that's just a temporary permission thing. Uh, but what that does is when somebody comments, that allows us to to actually, or allows me to actually get the feed right away, and it'll pop up and it'll say the person's name and whatnot, uh, versus um, if you don't do that, I'll, I mean, we just basically, it'll pop up on my screen and it'll say Facebook user. It doesn't really tell me who's watching or that sort of thing. Um, but if you guys have joined, just joined us, thank you so much. We both appreciate your your time and hanging with us um, weekly. And uh, this this week is a little bit different uh, for obvious reasons. So we're we're uh, trying to handle it a little bit different as well. Um, but that being said, uh, if you get a chance, go ahead and give us a like. Um, and then if you, wherever you're heralding from this evening, if you uh, want to shout out your, your location and church name or, uh, or who you represent, that's always helpful too. Um, what happens usually how Facebook runs the live type things is uh, they basically, if you, if you get on there, uh, it sends a message like kind of a, um, a broadcast message to, to your friends saying, hey, he's watching a live video. And so that way it kind of helps us get a little bit more um, more of our our name out there and, and known. Um, both both Paul and I do this strictly as a hobby or a volunteer. You know, we're not compensated um, by any anyone although if we have any sponsors listening or potential sponsors <laughs> i'm not going to oppose that <laughs> um, i don't like glocks <laughs> <laughs> can we <laughs> oh my goodness can we get a can we get glock a firearm company let's see ruger <laughs> Can I get a company to sponsor an hour of, of uh, live broadcasting and then, you know, we can start start a whole new thing of firearm reviews too. Hey. <laughs> Glock, we might end up losing our way there if we're not careful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Glock and Ruger, if you guys have anybody incognito that you're listening or Kimber, we can do that too. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So um, real quick, again, this is a, this is a kind of a different broadcast for us, but real quick, I just want to introduce myself a little bit and, and tell you my background. 
um, because we have a lot of new people in this group that could be watching this. And then I'll, I'll throw it over to Paul and kind of let him, um, him do a, a summary. Um, but uh, basically, um, my background was, was predominantly uh, fire and EMS. Um, I spent just over 10 years doing that. Uh, I've spent probably about 20, 25 years going through and teaching disaster management. And um, I've been involved as a, as a first aid instructor. Uh, I'm a, a chaplain currently with the Red Cross for disaster, uh, disaster relief. Um, you know, we, we st I stay busy with that between church stuff and, and I do a lot with the Red Cross. Um, but my background, um, I currently work full time for uh, the Defense Department as an analyst for them and not uh, not Jack Ryan type of analyst. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's my life. My job is interesting. So uh, every day is a little bit different, which might be why I got sucked into church safety so many years ago, because every day is just a tiny bit different. Um, but, uh, but that being said, I also, I've, I've spent probably the last 10, 10 to 12 years doing firearm training, tactical training. Uh, I, I train, uh, several train with and train several police departments in Ohio. Um, I've had the pleasure of doing that. Um, I've had the, the pleasure and privilege of working with, uh, as a reserve officer for the, uh, San Bernardino County Sheriff's office out in California. Uh, for several years, I was in charge of uh, some volunteer operations and and whatnot for them. So um, I kind of got sucked into uh, church safety because some things happened at the church that I was uh, I was attending. I'm I'm still attending there, and it just didn't seem like there was a good direction or positive positive outcome. And so. Um, you know, I kind of stepped in and somebody said, well, you look like a good guy to head up a committee. <laughs> don't, don't ever, no, don't ever volunteer for stuff at church because. <laughs> Every just... church safety team leader right now, like, don't listen to him, don't listen to him. <laughs> right. So, um, but uh, maybe someday I'll do a video of how I, I got into it, but. But yeah, I've I've been involved in it for quite a few years. Um, I talk to churches all the time. Um, you know, actually, this week has been probably one of the most chaotic weeks for me uh, with church safety because um, you know after Sunday, I mean, I literally spent probably five hours uh, on between online, on the phone, email, messaging, um, just churches all over all over the U.S. You know, really. Um, have decided to try and step up their step up their game game a little bit, and I I certainly understand and and respect that. So, um, but that kind of gives you a little bit of information about me. So, without further eloquence, I will turn it over to Mr. Buckner. <laughs> well, and I have to add briefly about uh, about your experience. I think today your wife had you working for the Department of the Fence. Yeah, <laughs> because I think you had a wind problem that took out some fencing at your house. So we did. We had uh, we had some crazy sixty mile an hour gusts of wind uh, Monday night, and uh, I woke up. Um, actually, Monday morning I woke up. Sunday night, uh, Monday morning I woke up, and uh, the wind had decided to make a sail out of our trampoline in the backyard, and and put it about a block down the road. Uh, in somebody else's yard, and the uh, the fence, <laughs> the fence in my backyard was no more. It did not stop it. So it it uh, yeah, it snapped off a couple of posts, and I've spent my last well, the last couple of days since Monday on my phone talking to churches and digging concrete post holes. <laughs> So thankfully I had a buddy come over today and, and, you know, I'm not, I do, you know, I've had a lot of different experience and I've always, you know, I've done a, a little bit of everything, you know, through my life. I just hate concrete. Right. So I've got, I'm trying to put concrete back in to re-cement these, these posts. 
And so I call the buddy and he comes down and he's like looking at, at the hole and then looking at me and then looking at the hole. And he's like, you know, there's an easier way to do this. And I said, that's exactly why I asked you to come down here. So thankfully we got, we got much of that squared away today and, and uh, I'm just letting it cure. <laughs> Otherwise I would be out there right now with a spotlight, probably drilling <laughs> on the fence boards. That's back. why you're here. <clears throat> but yeah, that's why I'm here. So anyhow, Mr. Buckner, the floor is yours. So tell us about yourself. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Do you want to, <clears throat> are you like pausing in thought here as to what to say? I was cause... trying to think of how to introduce myself. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to think of how to introduce myself. It may be, you know, it's, it, this um, is crazy. This is a God thing. So, maybe, so, maybe I should yeah, tell everybody I, that is on my end. Like it's like uh, buffering a little bit when you're talking oh. and then it catches up. Okay, I'm are you gonna getting, stop talking. <laughs> are you getting delays in it? A little bit, but not 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 crazy delays. <laughs> maybe you should tell everybody what. <laughs> well, we'll see if maybe the connection clears up over time. Um. <clears throat> okay. Okay, well, I'm trying to think how to introduce myself. I've done IT for 23 years uh, this month, actually. Now, it's now that it's January, and I, um, I really, uh, I really enjoy that. I'm slowly like changing my career over to doing uh, video work. And about eight or so years ago, I'd have to look back. Um, well, I'll go back to church safety. About 10 years ago, we had some, some small stuff happen at our church, kind of like what you were talking about, that just we weren't real thrilled with. And our pastor, um, it actually started off with a guy that was a convicted pedophile telling our pastor that he was going to come to our church, which he would have been observed, but he was actually telling our pastor that he was going to come to our church and he was going to basically approach a young lady that he'd been convicted of molesting and he was going to do that with or without our permission with or without the the family's permission and didn't really care what we thought and our pastor's like you're welcome to come to the church and we'll minutes and he informed him <clears throat> i miss my my pastor now that he's passed away but he informed him very plainly he said if you attempt to harm this little girl he said i will have four, four of the biggest men in our church pick you up by an appendage and precipitate you out the front door and made it very plain to the gentleman that he would not allow any harm to come to that little girl at our church. And that sort of began the church safety team. And I ended up running it. And um, and then about eight years ago or so, I ended up falling into, much like yourself, kind of becoming a, a chaplain. It, it had no intention of becoming a chaplain for law enforcement. It just sort of happened. And it started with getting equipment um, as a civilian, getting equipment for departments that were just absolutely broke. And anybody that's from a small town area or has friends from a small town area, a lot of times these little fire departments, these little police departments, mm -hmm. they're broke. And, um, and that's how it is in my area. And so people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that sort of became, I started getting calls uh, from officers saying, hey, we're about to go into something, please pray for us. Or saying, hey, um, um, I've seen some stuff that I really wish I hadn't seen. Would you, would you talk to me about it? And <clears throat> that has become numerous ride alongs. Um, I've been asked to go attend things before I've been brought in on private trainings and, uh, I have about 10 years of firearms and, and safety training. Of course, it's been sporadic and the last five years have been extremely intense. Um, and then <clears throat> the Lord kind of drafted me into some stuff. We had some folks that, they had family in our church that paid for me to go through an executive protection course, which if you ever get a chance to do that, anybody listening to this, go for it. Um, and it has paid off several times. Um, and it ended up being one of those things where when I, when I did that, it opened some other doors. And then the Lord has had me involved in protecting. There's been some in our area. Um, there are some, um, some ladies, Christian ladies, mostly medical backgrounds that what they do is they bring in, 
um, they, they help young ladies that have been sex trafficked. And uh, whether it's everything from little girls to, to elderly, believe it or not, and um, a group of us actually protect them. And I got drafted into that. And, and trust me when I say I'm the low man on that totem pole, but it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing that the Lord's doing. And then is, has it been two years that it's been pretty yeah. close year and a half, two years. Um, I, I got to know James and, and I had a little church safety group that 120, 125 people. And I saw his church safety group and I, I would occasionally share a video and then I got to talking and then he, he asked me to step in and help him run it. And um, it's been a wild ride because all of a sudden, what is it? 75 new members this week and running around, yeah. running around. Yes. Yeah, 1677 members, according to Facebook right now. And we, we are now the largest church safety group on Facebook. And then the Lord may have dropped an opportunity in our laps for a podcast. And if you had told me two years ago when I was about to <laughs> click to join that that was going to happen, I probably would have gone, ah! And, uh, but, but it's just how God does things. And um, so it's been, it's been a journey. So I guess that's, I guess that's our, uh, our uh, dating profile. We both filled out our dating profile now and everybody knows our background. Um, so do you want to get down to business or do you have any more pre pre video? Pre, pre. <laughs> well, I was just going to say what's, what's crazy funny too about this is, you know, we do, um, we have the, the technology now to bring individuals in and we do try and do that. Um, this, this group really has been from the get go has been um, kind of a passion of mine to go for profits or, or to be able to, um, get resources to the 90% of churches under 500 in the U S. And so, you know, Paul and I have, have worked very diligently on that. Um, believe it or not, we've never met each other in person before, which every once in a while, I'm still trying to figure out how to get to Missouri. If that's where you live or Texas, I don't know, somewhere South. Missouri. Yeah. <laughs> but when I think about it, it's like, it is, it has been a wild ride. It's been pretty crazy. Uh, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't have thought that, uh, you know, two years ago I thought, well, I'll just start this kind of group and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll chat about resources and stuff like that. And, and, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of gone from there, but <clears throat> let's, uh, let's go ahead. We'll get down to it. Cause I know, um, a lot of people, for some reason, I'm not sure. And you know, what's crazy is both of us have been to different conferences now where we've had people come up to us and be like, Hey, you're, you're that guy on Facebook that, <laughs> which is just kind of blows me away that, that people actually tune in and listen, listen to us. But one of the last videos that we did, um, we had over 500 views on it. And uh, that's, that's unbelievable. And that's really you guys just kind of hanging with us because honestly, I mean, to have a third engagement for your, you know, a third of your group actually engage and watch and, and be interactive um, is just unheard of as far as Facebook groups go and that sort of thing. So um, that's really, you know, that's just a testament to, you guys being a blessing to us and, and hang, hanging out with us. You know, we don't look at stuff like we're the, um, I don't know, like we're the, the all knowing the bomb on, on this stuff. We just, we like talking about it. We like dissecting it and, you know, talking about best practices and, and, um, you know, we, we have been there, you know, when I say that, I mean it, um, you know, 10 plus years ago, Paul and I were both in the, in the position that a lot of you churches listening now are in that, you know, you're like, Oh, okay. So what should I, sh where, which direction should I go now? You know? And I don't mean that, like, I, I'm not trying to be rude. I, I find humor in that to an extent because I just, I'm laughing at myself. I'm like, I remember being in that and like, there was nothing you know, church safety, church security, uh, 10 years ago was driving around in a park, you know, a parking lot and making sure that nobody broke into cars type thing. Maybe, you know, if yeah. you happen to be in a rough or more rough neighborhood and, you know, through the, through that course of 10 years, some of the stories that, um, of things that both of us have had to deal with, 
um, is just un unbelievable. I mean, I could tell you stories where, you know, almost as crazy as, as uh, white settlement, where it's like, oh my goodness, you know, I didn't get up this morning thinking that I was going to have to do this, but, you know, God put me in that, mm -hmm. in that place and he gave me the wisdom to kind of go through it and come out on the, on the upside of it. Um, so we're, we're blessed and we're honored to, to be here that, you know, that you guys listen to us and, and whatnot. So what we're going to do, um, again, this, the topic, we're going to talk a little bit tonight about training and then, uh, white settlement. Um, but, uh, you know, Paul and I, we, we like to try and open and close in prayer. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to, to Paul minus the lag. And, uh, <laughs> let, once that catches up with him, uh, we'll ask him to go ahead and open in, in prayer and then we'll get rolling. So whenever you're ready, sir, so on my, when my, on my end, the lag has, has caught up. So I'll open okay. in prayer. <clears throat> Lord God, we thank you uh, that we can come together in a, in a free country and we can we can visit and we can communicate uh, about these things. And, and Lord God, we're we're thankful for for our church bodies and our families. And Lord God, we lift up um, Jack Wilson and his family and, and the the families of those who who attend the church there, those who have lost loved ones, anyone affected by this this shooting. And we ask for protection, angelic and supernatural, over our church bodies. We ask, Lord God, that we could do as well in the crunch, in the clinch, if we had to do just that same thing. And Lord God, we come before you humbly, not to not to point fingers or look down on anyone, but to learn, to learn and to come away stronger and better. So we lift up uh, tonight and the opportunity that we have to to talk and to learn and to grow in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It wasn't so, too bad. Cool. All right. So you're still with me. I haven't lost you or anything. <laughs> okay. Yep. All right. So, um, you know, when I first heard that something was going on down in Texas, um, it was actually one of the members, and I apologize for not remembering uh, their name, but um, one of the members in this group posted, and uh, I saw, um, I was actually on my way home from church, and I saw the uh, the news article pending, and it was basically from uh, Fort Worth, I think it was fire, uh, fire and EMS dispatch saying, hey, you know, there's an active active shooter situation or active active situation at this location at this church and so i started kind of looking at it and trying to to get bits and pieces of news and and this is kind of talking about this is kind of new for for paul and i because we've never really had this group when we've had a, a, a active live situation like this and so when we start looking at it and then you know, we're like, okay, this is what this is what the FBI is saying. This is what the ATF is saying. This is what you know all the news channels are saying, and everything. We look at that information, and we're like, okay, well, we've seen, we've been involved on the backside of an investigation, where it's like, okay, we know we want to say something, but we can't always say something because we want to make sure that we have the correct facts to say this is what is known you know, to happen. Um, and, and once we have the whole picture, then we can sit back and say a little bit better, okay, this is, this is what we're thinking. This is what we're, um, we're looking at and that sort of thing. So, um, but to give you the narrative, if you, if you haven't followed, um, some of the situation to me, kind of piecing it together, um, it seems like this, this individual, uh, was heavily involved with this church. Uh, he was a homeless gentleman, homeless man. I'm not going to say gentleman. Uh, he he was a, a homeless man that went to the church looking for help. Um, the pastor of the church basically um, said that he was willing to help him with food and other things, food and clothing and other things, but would not give him money. And apparently, mm -hmm. man wasn't all there um, and was was acknowledged to not be all there um, and to have to be mentally deficient. Uh, I'll say that. And then uh, got mad at the pastor because the pastor would not give him cash that he asked for. 
Um, at this moment in time, um, I have not seen an official statement from um, Texas or from the investigating parties saying that that's not correct. Um, because I know the last I checked, they were still trying to figure out what the motive was. And to me, that seems like a pretty fair, um, fair line of thinking to say he, uh, this individual uh, was, was pretty upset that they wouldn't give him cash. And he devised this plan to get back at, at the church or get back at the pastor. Um, that being said, uh, he one Sunday came in and apparently he, because he had been there before, they recognized him and realized that he was dressed oddly and had a wig and um, like a, almost like a disguise on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fake beard, uh, fake, fake wig. Um, the clothes that he was wearing was out of place. So it was enough to, to raise a situation or raise awareness that something wasn't right. Um, and in, in interviews, uh, that, uh, and again, I'm not a, I'm not an authority on this. Uh, Paul and I have spent hours talking about this <laughs> and yeah, hours, literally and hours going through video, watching video, um, and listening to interviews with, with, uh, with Jack Wilson. I've actually reached out to Mr. Wilson, uh, and in his office to, see if maybe sometime he would come on here, if he would give us that honor, um, because I think that he's an awesome man of God that was put in a place in a situation that he did the best that he could with that situation. Um, Amen. But what it's what seemed like it happened was, uh, they so they were watching this guy, he, he went, he sat down, he jumped up, he went to the bathroom, he came back, he sat down, he jumped up again, uh, and then like the third time when they were getting ready to approach him, one of the safety team members approached him as he was approaching uh, a gentleman that was serving communion. And uh, at that point, he said something to the man, the usher serving communion, and uh, the usher responded. And then he, he drew out a shotgun and shot the usher. And then at that point in time, the safety team member uh, had reached into a, a, a small the back holster and tried to tried to pull a firearm out, uh, and he was basically hit with a second shot from this man. Um, at that time, at that point in time, uh, Jack Wilson, the the safety team director, was I I want to say about forty uh, feet away from this man. He drew his firearm. Um, which I believe was a SIG 357, if I'm not mistaken, um, went to shoot at the man with, you know, with the shotgun and could not get a clear shot. Um, so because there were individuals with the shooting going on, there were individuals that jumped up and, and it was just kind of, uh, as, as you can imagine, was, um, was just not, uh, not great for, for what was going on. Um, but <clears throat> the second shot that he took or the first shot that he took, um, <clears throat> Jack Wilson, that is, uh, ended up actually being right on, um, in the distance when you look at things. And again, I'm not, uh, I'm not investigating this. I'm just kind of piecing together what I've seen from what I've seen. So, um, you know, the individuals, the process shot, et cetera, et cetera. I could be kind of making mistakes as, as far as somebody said the safety team member was shot first. I'm not sure. Um, I'm just kind of giving you a rough from what I know. Um, so when at the point in time when Jack Wilson took aim on him, he had turned around and he was headed back towards uh, the front of the building, towards the stage where the pastor was. So it's kind of, I mean, to, to us, I mean, Paul and I have talked about it a little bit, but to us, it kind of seems like uh, maybe um, he was, or, or his final intent was to actually shoot towards the pastor or, or to try and take the pastor out. Um, at that point, you know, Jack Wilson, again, engaged from, from what I can figure based on the video 
and and listening to interviews with Mr. Wilson, um, we're looking at a distance of probably about 45 to 50 feet um, that he made that shot. The target was moving. Um, he he took the he took the the guy down with one shot, which is amazing to me. Um, I mean, I've, I've yeah. been in firearms and shooting and training as long as I have, and I don't think I could have made that shot. And I'm just being honest and, and transparent with you guys. Um, I don't know that I could have either. But he made the shot. Um, you know, there's there's a big argument there for saying that, that God steadied his hand and, um, you know, made it happen. And, you know, and then we have the video uh, a few minutes later of, uh, multiple, at least six or seven other individuals with firearms. Once that happened, jumping up to run over to him and and make sure that the man was uh, the man was down. And from what I understand, uh, Mr. Wilson said in an interview that he walked over with the gun still pointed and then kicked the shotgun away. And uh, basically, they they stood in that. Uh, that place waiting for law enforcement to get get there and take over the situation. So what blows my mind again, there's there's three things kind of looking at this and then I'll toss it toss it over to Paul to, to see what he thinks but thanks but there are three things that, that blow my mind with this. First of all, um, the shot, okay I mean that to me when I heard the distance and I, I saw the interviews and stuff, I'm like, I need to practice more. I need to go out and I need to be practicing because um, anticipating a 50 foot shot is with shooting a target the size of, you know, a cantaloupe at 50 feet. Exactly. That, that is amazing. Okay. Um, the second thing that, that was moving, that was moving. It was right. moving. Yeah. <laughs> um, the second thing that, that kind of popped into my head was, um, just looking at everything was that the safety team was on it okay now in the video you see individuals respond with firearms and stuff like that they have a safety team um and it's not clear if those individuals were part of that safety team uh, paul kind of pointed that out earlier uh to me today which is true because there could have been somebody visiting that was carrying that responded uh, mr wilson hasn't really said which, which I also appreciate that, you know, there's no, he hasn't really come out and said, yeah, we have this many safety team members that responded, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then the third thing, the final thing that really kind of like, uh, kind of blew me away was that the whole thing, the whole situation was done in under 10 seconds. It was actually him drawing and shooting, uh, Mr. Wilson drawing and shooting his firearm in six seconds. And so when I look at those three things um, and, you know, again, just, just kind of analyze and okay, I don't honestly know that I could have done that. I, I'd like to sit there and I'd like to think that, you know, if something happened like that, that I would be that fast. Um, you know, I mean, we both, we both practice, <laughs> we both practice a lot. Uh, we both shoot probably more than the average person does. And I'd, I'd like to think that we're both pretty good with our shots. Maybe that's being modest. I don't know. I like being modest with that because then I don't have to live up to a higher standard because I'm not going to walk around and say, wow, I'm a dang good shot. But, um, you know, all joking aside, that's 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 pretty phenomenal and the fact that it was done and everything was over within that length of time um just kind of proves and and shows that things can happen very quickly things can happen and go south very quickly and you know they were watching this individual because he he had flags you know he had red flags that popped up from his behavior and and i don't think honestly um uh, you know what? I've been in that situation where I've had somebody bounce up and down and leave the sanctuary and come back and and leave and come back and you know I I think that from now on I'm going to look at it entirely different um, and I'm going to look at it like you know what uh, probably with a little bit more caution than you know I have in the past just because um, because this 
you know, this happened. And, you know, what's interesting is, you know, immediately after this happened, I started talking with, with some of my safety folks and we were kind of texting them back and forth. And, and one of the guys that uh, is a very close friend of mine and, and that serves with me, the first thing he said is, well, dang, I guess I better practice at 50 feet. And it's like, you know what, we condition, we condition ourselves at a distance of 15 to 20 feet because we're in the mindset of, okay, if I was out in the open, you know, and I had to protect myself from my family, that's, that's a retreatable distance with the amount of time, uh, you know, FBI statistics say an individual can travel um, 10 feet or 15 feet in about three seconds. So, you know, 15 feet, at least in Ohio, 15, 20 feet is usually a good reference point to say, okay, I need to make a decision um, and, and kind of, kind of go from there. But uh, I don't know. I, I, I agree with the idea that, you know, most of our church sanctuaries are, you know, 50, 80 feet across. I know from the stage of my sanctuary to the back doors, uh, it's about 120 feet. So considering and, and keeping that in mind, that means that I'm going to have to travel a long ways before I can be comfortable with, you know, with discharging a firearm and not doing it foolishly. And I say foolishly yeah. not because I wouldn't have the mindset to do that. I say foolishly because at a hundred, at a distance of 120 feet, you shouldn't be shooting at anything at that point, because at that point, all you're going to, all you're going to do is you're going to be hitting um, and making collateral damage. And unfortunately in a, in a full church type situation, you're probably going to be hitting somebody that's a, a church member or something like that. So if you're not comfortable with training at a distance, you know, or you haven't taken the time to like measure, measure distances in your sanctuary across your church, make reference points. Um, what we did, we actually went out and got glow in the dark tape and we stuck it to the bottom of the chairs and in the sanctuary. And we know, okay, you know, three or four of these is 15 feet. So if I count, you know, if I look down or I in responding, if I look down and I see three or four of those, then I know, okay, this is what that distance is. And, you know, I can, I can do that. But, um, so yeah, so let me throw it over to you and you can tell me what you think about all of that. <laughs> You've covered some good points already that I had. I'm, I'm sitting there scratching some of the things out of my notes, which I like. <clears throat> you and I have a lot of similar thought processes. Um, I actually practice for fun. I think I tagged you in a couple of videos. I practice shooting my, my chosen everyday carry sidearm out to 100 yards. Um, and I can hit a chest size torso about every other shot. And if I, if I practice regularly, I can do it almost every time, but that's dead calm on a great day with no stress. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And nobody's screaming, nobody's running. You can, you can make amazing shots, but the fact that Mr. Wilson was able to do that under stress, under pressure, knowing that two people that he loved, I mean, he talks about in one of the interviews that he's known some of these people for 50 years, um that they were down that's a lot of stress that's a lot of that's a lot of uh, adrenaline shooting up your blood pressure is going crazy and knowing that i mean he knows because he stood up that team a couple years ago he knows he's the heavy hitter on that team and he knows he that he has the best firearms training and so there's a lot of pressure to perform at that point and he stepped right up to it half of the time it took him to get the shot off was getting a clear shot he stated in a couple of interviews that the only shot he had was the head. And I have seen people argue that it was stupid for him to take a head shot. Well, in a perfect world uh, where, mm -hmm. where the bad guy turns around and stands there and gives you their full body, um, that, that may be one thing. But in the real world where bad guys tend to do bad things while moving and they don't tend to want to get shot, um, you may not have a choice. And one of the, one of the instructors that I enjoy studying under, he's like, if, if the target you have is a shoulder, shoot that target. And when they move, shoot the next target. So you have to, you have to be able to hit what's available. And he didn't have time or, or an opportunity for spray and pray. 
it wasn't mm-hmm. like it was a hallway with nobody behind him and the backstop was was you know Mount Ararat. He didn't have <laughs> that, you know. Um, he he had he had a wall behind him, but the guy had pivoted, and I'll talk more about this in a minute. The guy had pivoted about 120 degrees and was proceeding towards the stage. Mm-hmm. You talk about being in the clinch. I mean, that was it was crunch time, and he was able to handle it. So I want to go back because you made some great points, and I want to kind of piggyback on a couple of those. Um, so he started the, the safety team there at the church less than two years ago. And I have to say, I have to doff my hat. I don't know what some of the training of some of the others were. I know that he mentioned in the interview that I saw that a couple people there, one for sure was retired FBI. And that may explain, there was one guy that looked like he was pretty squared away. Um, secondly, we don't know what all the other backgrounds, these guys may be X Delta. I mean, I'm being silly, but we don't know what their background is, but mm-hmm. they all ran into the sounds of the guns. Uh, Mr. Wilson is prior military and prior law enforcement. He was a reserve sheriff's deputy. Um, The way that he talked, he he had not been in this kind of a situation before, but he had mentally prepared himself for the fight. And I love the fact because I've been praying about him and I've been concerned, um, very concerned about him and praying for him because taking a life is not easy. And in the course of those prayers, I hear him in an interview uh, that I got to listen to uh, late this afternoon talking about the fact that he has been he has had people reach out to him from numerous organizations um, and from with his within his circle of friends saying, hey, uh, when you need to talk, if you need to talk, I'm here, let's do lunch, let's get together. And <clears throat> trust me, those dark moments are going to come. And I love the fact that he has that support group. And we have to remember that no matter how strong we seem in a situation like that, um, we're going to be fighting. We're going to be fighting some some mm-hmm. emotional issues um, and survivor's guilt, um, an, an, among other things. Um, he's been an instructor and in selling firearms. I believe, I believe if I got the, the order right, he's been an instructor since 95 and selling firearms since 96. Um, that's a long time. And he's owned two different ranges. One of them burned down. He's built another one. So his military training and his law enforcement training has paled, uh, next to the amount of time that he spent, uh, being able to train. And he had the advantage of a private range, which I do too. I have, a, I can walk out my back door and shoot. But that I just love. I love the fact that he's the consummate student. I mean, you can tell that he's that he's studied. So for a team that was just stood up less than two years ago, they were pretty squared away. And something else I wanted to mention was I want to piggyback on what you made the comment about the fact that maybe not everybody that responded was um, part of their safety team. We need to be prepared for the fact that there may be people in our churches that whether we have a firearms carry uh, policy there or not, that they're going to carry anyway. And um, there were there were probably, I would say, upwards of half a dozen people that I knew of that were cleared by our church to carry on top of our safety team. And I, and they had approached me and I had basically said, I'd like to have you guys as kind of like my my sleepers, like a, like a you know, backup in case of an emergency. Some of them didn't have the ability to run and tackle people. Their health wasn't that good. But I had several of them that told me, if you ever find yourself in a problem, I've got your back. And so I jokingly called them my, my sleeper cell. But it was very good to know. But I would guarantee you, you could probably add another half dozen people. I'm, I'm in southern Missouri, and we're about like Texas. You know, it, it's one of these things where, where grandma's packing heat. And uh, so in a situation like that, there was a lady that actually had drawn her pistol at this church shooting and was actually moving and she had it up in the air. I actually admired the way that she moved a lot. She may have been on that safety team and she may not have. I'm not saying she was or wasn't, but um, we don't know who was or wasn't on that safety team. And and if Mr. Wilson is wise and thinks about it in advance, he's not going to state how many people are on his safety team. I, I refused to tell people, and I know you're the same way. I refused to tell people how many people are on my safety team. And whenever two times in 10 years, people come up and say, I figured out how many people are on your safety team. And I'm like, no, you haven't. <laughs> because I had people that never, never served a rotation. They never stood watch. They never had an earpiece in, but they were heavy hitters. And they, their job was to sit in a couple of sp- uh, specific places that if something happened, I could trust that they would go in. And I want to go back because <clears throat> you, you made some great points in there that you were talking about. I want to add some things to it. So they knew him, right? They had helped him with with food, but refused to help him with money. Most of our churches are that way. Um, they um, they had actually positioned that camera 
and turned it is my understanding. And I, I can't say that camera, but I'm going to give you a pretty good, it's a pretty good bet that it was because it's a wonky angle. And I'm going to talk more about that angle later because I think it does us a, di a bit of a disservice from the angle and it might make it look like things are happening that aren't exactly happening the way we think they are. Mm -hmm. But Mr. Wilson had actually placed a man behind, and I think it was unfortunately the man that lost his life. Um, either Mr. Wilson placed him or that man placed himself behind the shooter. And that's what we all do. I mean, you've done that with the guy that was getting up and bouncing around your church, and I've done that with people. I've gone and sat with people. And I would rather be really, really close because maybe I could stifle that draw of the sidearm or, you know, if they're going for a knife or whatever. Um, so they, they were doing a lot of things really, really well. And I've got, especially for a young team, I've just got to take my hat off to that. And mm -hmm. then <clears throat> angling the camera was an interesting thing. We didn't have cameras in our sanctuary, but it's an interesting thing to have the forethought to go angle the camera so that it was aimed at the guy. It actually states that in one of the interviews that they had turned a camera towards the guy. And that is probably one of the reasons that we have such a clear view dead on with the bad guy in the center. We have such an amazing view of it. This is literally an unprecedented view. We get to take the roof off the church and peek in and see. And I'm not, not for a minute do I want anyone to think that I'm minimizing what happened or taking away from the victims. But we have been blessed with an opportunity to see what a real life shooting inside of a church looks like because a lot of what we pull uh, trainers as church safety uh, team leaders is we pull from police body camera footage and convenience store robberies. This is actually a shooting inside of a church. And at, to my knowledge, it's unprecedented access to something like this. And then I want to jump to a couple of more things. Um, so the gentleman get up on his own. Nobody's talking to him. They're serving communion. Uh, the deacon was standing there with the communion tray and he accosts the deacon. And he comes right up on him. And if you watch, if you're watching pre-fight indicators, he turns. I'm going to turn so that this actually makes sense. And he's leaning in in the footage. And that is for those of us that have taken um, body language training and 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 we know about pre-fight cues. Um, if we uh, if we have studied like vasal constriction and all these things that happen, the fact that he was jumping up is 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 an indicator that they were aware of. And he's going in and out. And they were taking a lot of precautions. Um, you know, it's, I, I admire the fact that they were taking those precautions. And then, um, the fact that he was leaning in on that, <clears throat> we all can sit back and have the Monday morning quarterback view of this mm -hmm. because we don't have six seconds to make a life or death decisions. We can watch it 57 times and we can, we can, um, assure ourselves that we would have handled it better. And I've seen some people make some really rude statements online, both in and outside of church safety about this, that are very disappointing. You and I have talked about that mm -hmm. and prayed about how to do this lovingly with respect for, for the survivors and those that lost their lives. And um, I will tell you that in a situation like that, I will be much quicker to act, especially now. Um, the minute that I now would would see somebody lean towards somebody and say something where they leaned in and emphasized something that that threatening behavior, I will be wheels up and headed in. And, and not I'll be friendly, but I'll be headed closer because is that guy pulling a road flare and some gasoline out? Is he is he pulling a knife, or is he is he has he somehow wedged a pump pistol grip shotgun up underneath his outfit? and been able to drop it. And that's one more thing I want to talk about. I got a couple more quick things and I want to toss the ball back to you. Um, but he brought in, in a close range environment, he brought in a superior weapon. Um, there is no contest between a, a handgun at that range and a shotgun. And um, I'm assuming from the, from the way that people were injured, it probably was double up buck. I can't tell you it could have been birdshot at that range and still done the deed. But they were facing a really bad threat in really close quarters with a guy who premeditatedly planned this. And that's something we can't forget. This guy thought it through, wore a disguise, mm -hmm. was working himself up to this. And, and, and the disguise, unfortunately, actually helped him to hide some of his emotion. And mm -hmm. so he might have been – he probably had vasal constriction – and he probably was swallowing and moving and doing things that were pre-fight indicators that were that would have let them know. But probably without knowing it, he had hidden them. I believe I'm highly suspicious of the fact that he intended to survive this encounter. 
-hmm. And I believe, I'm pretty convinced that, that he intended to assassinate the pastor. He got up, he initiated a confrontation, the deacon pointed, and I don't know if he was saying, you know, hey, brother, I don't know, you might talk to him, but he pointed, the shotgun comes down, and the first safety member goes down, the deacon goes down, and then he makes a 120-degree pivot towards the stage, which the only person right there, whoever was on the stage, and I assume it was the pastor, mm -hmm. smart person, dropped flat and was going off the stage. Yeah. And so I'm going to hit, I'm basically just going to read these, and then I'm going to toss the ball back to you. Um, Mr. Wilson was forced to take a human life, and then while he was standing guard over the man, he watched him die. That's something we need to pray for him about. Mm -hmm. um, um, he was forced to tell and retell his story to local law enforcement, the Texas Rangers, the FBI, probably ATF. I hadn't heard about that until you mm -hmm. mentioned it, but it makes sense. And then several different news uh, sources that he's talked to. Um, that's not easy. That's not easy. Um, every member of the congregation that was present in the room had to remain at the church until law enforcement had taken all of their statements. And I deeply admire the fact that Mr. Wilson refused to leave until the last person's interview was over by his own statement. That's a leader. That is a leader. He has my respect. And because it, I would want to fold up somewhere in a corner at that point. It would be so hard to deal with that. But he was, the, he was a leader and he stayed. Um, and then some of the last people to respond into the room, and then I'm going to toss this back to you, that that were may or may not have been safety team members they were probably out in the foyer or maybe even out in the parking lot there's been a lot of criticism from people and i don't think it's i don't think it's completely founded i'm, I'm going to be very diplomatic in some cases i don't think it's justified at all that these people came in and they were sweeping the room and, and I'll, I'll go back and address that later and you, you're welcome to say whatever you want at any point that you want to talk about that but they came into the room now imagine James, you and I, let's put ourselves in that circumstance. We're out in the foyer. We look at each other. We hear shots fired. We burst in the, the sanctuary doors. We're going to have our weapons out. People mm -hmm. are moving. Any one of them could be the shooter. We don't know that the shooter's down. Nobody's given an all clear. And we see a group of people in a corner, and we're looking. Um, I guarantee you, based on training and the life experience that I've had, my weapon would be out. My finger would be indexed along the side of that slide. And I would be mm -hmm. looking at people over my weapon, and that's going to probably draw some ire. But anybody with a large amount of professional training is going to tell you they go into an environment and they may they may see a civilian and sweep over that civilian, but mm -hmm. you may also go nope, 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 yep, boom. And uh, so that's really where I want to leave that is to say these people came in last, had no clue what was going down, and I think yeah. by and large handled themselves admirably so and and really you're absolutely right they they did <clears throat> they did handle themselves admirably um one of the things that kind of kind of pops into my head you said you know nobody nobody had given the all clear yet which is true they hadn't um and you know for those of those of you that might like to criticize some of the actions or or whatnot Keep in mind that they didn't know at that point. I mean, we're we're only talking maybe twelve or fifteen seconds into this, so they had no idea if there were multiple shooters. They had no idea if there were you know people coming. You know, maybe it was a diversion for other you know for for something else going on. And what I find interesting is uh, the Department of Homeland Security released a, uh, and we shared it in the group, but they released a tabletop discussion for houses of worship um, on handling um, situations that might cause a, um, I don't know, a distraction. And that information packet is actually for, for those of you that are interested, um, that information packet comes with PowerPoint, um, comes with notes and, and whatnot. Um, but it's absolutely free. I was actually able to download and, and print and look at that. And what's interesting is reading through that, there's probably about five modules. And uh, what they did was each module has something different based on like a church service. And so you're constantly throwing stuff in, but the stuff that they threw in is not unrealistic. Um, you know, one of the things with with this this guy um, that I believe Mr. Wilson said in an interview was that he came in with a backpack. 
um, when, you know, when you look at like the uh, Department of Homeland Security's scenario, one of the things is a backpack. An individual comes in with a backpack and sits it down. An explosion happens. You've got people running out. Um, maybe somebody else snuck in a, an exit door. Um, this is all stuff that, you know, and, and they put it together and I'm reading through and I'm like, you know what, they got to they got to write on with this because this is all stuff like the worst, worst day, the worst nightmare. But at the same time, it's all stuff that we should be paying attention, paying attention to and looking at and saying, you know what, um, there are there are groups. I mean, it can happen there. There are groups of individuals that plan stuff out like that uh, versus, you know, just lone wolves or, or that sort of thing. You know, we've had several situations with multiple involving, like at our church, involving multiple people. And so you kind of have to tag team it and look at it like, okay, what's going on? Is this a diversion? And getting back to, you know, how that team responded. We don't know you know, if maybe half of the team was slower because they were, you know, looking where we couldn't see with the camera, you know, so again, there's, there's all this stuff out there and it's like, and, and I've seen some crazy stuff too. And I kind of, um, you know, I mentioned it to Paul and I'm like, oh my goodness, who's, you know, social media, you either love it or you hate it. But I've seen stuff out there, you know, claiming that these folks were idiots. And I'm like, what in the world how can you say that when you weren't there and you don't even know and you know you're you're just making assumptions and and of course i mean that's that's just the way people are um what impressed me was you're you're absolutely right i wanted to go back to what you said about the interviews and the fact that you know he has to tell his story mr wilson has to tell his story at least 20 to 30 times to different individuals, different departments, different agencies. And what was interesting to me was, um, and, and we kind of chatted a little bit about this, but there was a, a bit where um, he, at, almost like at his home, he was doing a press release. That was like the first video that came out about him. And then like he released, I think a second or third video and then um, there is a video floating around. I think it was Fox News, one of the local Fox affiliates that that did a uh, an interview with him, where it was like away away from everything, where it was like a, a I don't know five or seven minute interview. It was pretty it was pretty lengthy. But what what was interesting to me is just watching. And I watch. I mean, I watch people. I think to an extent we all do. But just watching how he responded throughout the videos um when he got like the first few videos he was like this is what happened it was like machine gun like right at you know right at that, 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 that okay this is what happened this is what's going on when he got to the last one um which was a day or two after and he was talking about it and recounting it um <clears throat> to the newscaster he paused and what was interesting was he was telling the story and she was asking questions about the other safety team, team member that lost his life and the usher. And, um, you know, he paused and I and I I have to think that it is really hitting him hard. And the fact that, you know, again, these these are people and, you know, most of us are close to our churches. I mean, I, the church that I've been going to, I've been going there for 12 or 13 years so to me, I honestly, I can't imagine just dealing with that anxiety of, um, you know, one of my friends stepping in and trying to, to do what he felt was right. And, you know, and that, that individual, uh, I believe his name was Richard. Um, he is as much of a hero as, as Mr. Wilson is for the fact that, I mean, he gave his life for that congregation. And, and obviously we don't know a lot of the specifics, but we do know that for sake of time, it might have been a situation where that gave Mr. Wilson enough time to actually, you know, draw his firearm and and make that shot versus, you know, versus not um, or something else. You know, maybe, you know, I again, I can't imagine a shotgun 
being used in a sanctuary like that. Um, but I, you know, that's literally a nightmare scenario because most of the time we picture somebody trying to come into the building and they've got a long gun and you're, you're engaging them at that distance. <clears throat> we don't think about bloop, and he's right there. It's not something that we generally, we generally think of happening because it doesn't commonly happen in churches. And it, this is going to be one of those things we talked about how this was going to be like the Miami Dade shooting and, and it changed mm -hmm. law enforcement for 30 years. And um, it changed the caliber people carried. It changed what they carried. It changed how they carried. And it caused one shooting, caused a revolution within law enforcement. And if we are smart as church safety team leaders and as church safety team members, we're going to do a whole lot of gut checking. How do I carry? Where do I carry? What do I carry? Why do I carry? Do I carry backup magazines? How often do I shoot? How far away can I hit? Can I draw? Could I have drawn on that man? What are my hand-to-hand -hand skills? All of these things, if we're smart, we're going to learn and be students of this shooting as though we were law enforcement studying Miami-Dade. So, I mean. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It, and having the, um, having the ability, like you mentioned earlier, having the ability to actually watch it and see. I mean, it does. You know, it, it changes. I was I was talking to an individual today that was like, well, I only need to practice shooting 15 to 20 feet and I'm good. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm not, you know, and again, if I if I laugh or I chuckle, it's just the irony because I'm like, you know what? To me, that just opened my eyes to say, you know, now and again, I'm not saying that that would ever happen twice. But what I am saying is you know, the, the wise man, you know, the, the individual that's being wise and prudent reviews history, reviews what's happened and prepares for the future, you know, and uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to bring out my $5 analogy that I, I told you earlier today. Um, but it's, it's true. And that's, you know, driving, I was thinking about, I've got two, um, <laughs> two teenagers that I'm teaching how to drive or one, one that I'm teaching how to drive, one's just got a license. And I started thinking about that. I thought, you know, I've been driving now for 20, 25, almost 30 years. So when I think about that, have I absolutely been exposed to every possible bad thing that's happened on the road? No. No, I haven't. Now, I've gone through, I've had my share of, you know, over those years, I've had my share of car accidents. I've had my share of, you know, people running into me, sliding off the road in, in bad weather, you know, just like anybody else. But that that history has prepared me to come to grips and understand that even though I may not absolutely know every possible bad thing that could happen to me while I'm driving, I'm prepared for it. Or at least I try to prepare for it based on a flat line in my training. If the, the one thing I can't prepare for is the flexibility of people, right? If I'm driving down a highway, I can't, I can't train or justify for how somebody else is going to act driving down the highway. I can't prepare for that to an extent. Now I can react and be focused with what I do based on what's going on around me. And I think so, so many times, you know, and, and it applies to safety teams too. I think in so many times we're only looking at what's going on around us instead of kind of stepping back and saying, okay, you know, having the, the ability to step in and make a wise decision that doesn't require training that requires me to have an open and flexible mind to be able to say, okay, you know what, this has happened before. How would I handle this? How can I be better, better prepared to handle this? And, you know, when I think about that and I think about um, things like, <clears throat> you know, the, the first, uh, first church shooting down in Texas, you know, years ago that Jimmy Meeks talks about often, um, the first recorded church shooting in Texas. Um, you know, I think about that and I think where, where have we gotten today? Cause we do things today in church safety that they wouldn't have thought of doing, you know, back then. 
Um, we look for red flags in churches that they wouldn't have, you know, looked for back then. So I think that um, as a whole, I think that just being prudent and understanding and and looking ahead and saying, you know what, um, I think it's I think it's smart for me to make sure that <laughs> um, you know my uh, I have to shift my computer here for a second, but um, I, I think it's smart and it's it's wise for me to look at the at the past events and past history and and train for it and practice for it. You know, that Lord willing, obviously that never happens. It never comes to the point of me having to, um, you know, use those skills or that skill set. But at the end of the day, you know, what's, why is that a bad thing? You know, if I, if I go out and I shoot and, and I practice shooting more at a, at a bigger distance, why is that an issue? It just means that I've gone out and I've, I've practiced more. Right. So takes a little bit more of my time, but, and, you know, I mean, from, from that standpoint, what, what frustrates me, and this is again, just me being honest with, with you all watching, what frustrates me is that, you know, the, the Monday morning quarterback, and that's kind of why we hesitated too so much or the length of time we did to really wait, because we know there's not, you know, there wasn't answers out there. So we had, in both of our minds, we had questions about, okay, how would they do this? Well, they didn't talk about, he didn't talk about a safety team on his first interview. You know, Mr. Wilson didn't. So, you know, it's like, okay, was he just, was he a visitor? What ha you know, we don't know that whole story. So for us, to me, there's nothing more frustrating than to being, to be, <laughs> to be, then to be like, oh, hey, this is what happened. Oh, whoops you know, tomorrow I need to come back on here and tell you, this is not what happened. This, you know, I was mistaken. That's embarrassing. But anyway, I'll, I'll you need to put an egg on your face. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. Um, I, I said you end up with egg on your face because oh. you have to go back and recant it. Um, I, I want to piggyback on what you said. You used an analogy um, of driving, and we had talked about. There's a book I'm I'm listening to right now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> has nothing to do with church safety. Has nothing to do with anything like this. We talked about this analogy, and I love it because the guy said that that when we have certain thoughts, um, sayings that we have, ways that we look at life, whatever, it's like having the handle of a suitcase. And when he explains it, he says, "Then you've got your suitcase." And he said. Um, if somebody says, um, the only thing that stops, and I, I'm going to use this saying, the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Okay. That's a good saying. As long as we're aware of the suitcase underneath it, that's full of all these other things, because mm -hmm. the good guy with a gun practiced, trained, knew what he was doing, set the safety team. They all responded. And, and that's a whole lot more than walking around with a handle and no suitcase. And I don't know about you, but I've had suitcases break while I was carrying them. I think we've all had that experience, thud, you know, and then you're just holding a handle. Um, that was so apropos to this situation because I've literally read things online. I've been tagged in people's posts. I've read things online where people have, um, they have just butchered that church or, or butchered or, or, or just launched into, it's, it's, I can't even go there. It just bothers me so much. And I'm like, you weren't there. And um, we've actually talked about this um, in Messenger, and I talked about this with several friends. I'm like, that camera angle, and that's the thing I'm going to launch into next. So I'm going to segue into that. But that sure. camera angle, if we're here, that camera was not here. So Mr. Wilson is inside the rat maze. He's down here at this level looking this way. We're above it at an angle. It's the same thing that I see people do with, with ball games. They do it with hockey games, with football games, with basketball games. They're not at this level looking through a whole bunch of people lunging around moving, trying to hit the ball, trying to make a basket, trying to tackle people. That's a lot of chaos at this level. But if you can get above it at an angle, which is where we watch football, I don't, but it's where you watch football, it's where you watch <laughs> basketball when you're, when you're not there, you can see things differently. But it also it gives us an unfair advantage – several ways and and that's what bothers me so much about monday morning quarterbacking and and by the way I, i've got to go off on this for a second these are not paid basketball stars they don't have million dollar deals they don't practice sure. three hours a day 
Um, they aren't the the best at what they do. Mr. Wilson doesn't go around signing shoes. Um, he he doesn't have endorsements yet from major from major environments. These are not trained athletes. So so how dare we sit down and critique their ball game as though their performance as though it was a ball game? And I've heard people go off on them, and I'm like, oh my gosh. And in the moment, you and I have been in some hairy situations, and in the moment, the whole thing was over, like you said, in six seconds. It takes about two seconds for the average person to go from completely dull sense to, oh, crud, something's happening. Well, you just cut a third of your reaction time out. He already had his weapon out mm -hmm. at the about, and I'd have to look at it again, but around the three-second mark, and then he was moving – and then he engaged the guy and and hit him. You know that was a that was a Larry Bird full court shot, and uh, to use the sports analogy. And I, I I I'm you and I talked about this a lot privately about how much it has bothered us and how much we wanted to handle this in a loving way. Because honestly, and it, this may come off rude to folks, but the lion's share of the folks that are saying this stuff could not have performed at that level. Yeah. It's literally like a guy that's 400 pounds uh, sitting in his house going, oh, I guarantee you I could have I could have landed that. I could have I could have slam dunked my basketball. I could have I could have made that touchdown. Oh, I would have pivoted around that guy and I'd have had that, you know, no, you wouldn't have. And and that is one of the things that bothers me the most. And then I wanted to jump over before I get myself in too much trouble. Um, <laughs> so I I covered the camera angle. So one of the things I wanted to talk about, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this briefly and then I'm going to move on. So, so this is a weapon pointed and flagging people. This is not a weapon pointed <laughs> flagging people. There were not Philistines lining the walls in that. Um, and so, so when, and I've had a couple of friends go back and review the video because I'm like, I think the angle is so steep that it mm -hmm. makes this angle with the weapon look like this angle with the weapon. And yeah. to be sure, there were some people that probably did some flagging. And I guarantee you the bad guy had a weapon pointed at him afterwards. And I'm proud of Mr. Wilson for having the mental wherewithal after the shock at him to push the shotgun back, pick it up and move it and take responsibility for it because you just never know. Um, someone might have run up and picked that thing up and tried to shoot the bad guy again, and then they're up on charges. So, so I deeply admire his performance at that point. But I think some people have really unfairly treated that safety team or whoever some of those folks were. They, again, they may not have been on the safety team, but the one lady, her one was here, kudos, and she was moving and trying to, trying to be helpful and whatever. Um, and then I a lot of the guys were actually moving here until they had a clear angle on the bad guy. Is it perfect? No. But that's the thing about what's the old saying, um, no plan survives contact with the enemy. Um, there's yeah. no such thing as a perfect performance under those circumstances. And anybody that's been in combat, anybody that's been a firefighter, anybody that's been EMS, and I know you've been been both and been around both, anybody that's been in a, an actual shootout swing at them, it, it doesn't go like the movies. And so, again, I'm going to stop there before I yeah. get, like, letters. But um, <laughs> I, w <laughs> I wanted to talk about a couple more things and just get your thoughts on these as well. I think we need to honest assess our skill sets. I think that's what this thing, if there's any takeaway I have, I'm a good shot. I'm better than the average Joe, dead calm. I mean, I, I was playing with a friend of mine one day, and, and he's incredibly good. He, he's competitively. He's kind of gotten me into that world a little bit. We at, at nine feet, at three yards, we were shooting shotgun shells, empty shotgun shells off the top of a, of a target, a little target stand. And then turning, and at 100 yards, we were ringing steel, a chest size, IDPA size steel target. Now, that was halfway through a day's worth of training, and I'm very competitive, um, you know, in a polite way. And so, th but that was dead calm. That was right. dead calm. That was not under that stress. And then I wanted to go, um, these people all ran towards the, the aggressive situation. And then, um, and again, I'm reading my notes so there's a couple things that I think that we really can benefit from. And I know you do this and I do this. Um, there's a couple of my buddies that are actually watching this. I saw them come on. I know they do this. Um, I practice my draw stroke. I practice pulling my shirt out of the way. So, you know, 
my support hand in, just like you do, in, weapon, over, up, out, and I practice. And there is many a, um, and I dry fire practice with that too often, there's many a light switch, um, many a candle on the wall, many a, <laughs> many a, a picture, many a smoke detector uh, that has been the victim of my dry fire practice where I pretend shot it because, uh, and, and my wife loves it. <laughs> when I sit next to her during a TV show and I'll spend four or five minutes and I will, I'll come up and out and I'll dry fire practice and I'll, I'll move out. I've got the muscle memory down to the point now that if I look over and there's a couch across the room from where I'm at and there's a, there's a little uh, piece of wood that's, you know, cut along the top of it right here, I guarantee you I could draw and draw a bead on that thing. And my muscle memory is going to bring that front sight to my eyeball. I don't have to turtle. I don't have to move. It's going to bring it right to that. That kind of practice based on the training we've got, and you're just such a trainer, you're going to give people the tools, but they then have to go continue to practice with that. We all should gut check ourselves after watching a video like this and go, oh, my word, could I have taken that shot? Could I have reacted that fast? And and we also need to think about the fact, could we have cleared the holster in that time? Because I literally have talked to church safety folks, and God bless them, I love them. They're, they weren't on my team, but I've talked to them with other other churches and, and at, at events where they never practice shooting. They never dry fire practice. They never practice their draw stroke. Um, there's a really good chance that had been had Mr. Wilson not been as squared away as he was, that the bad guy would have gotten off a shot, possibly run up, and if that was the pastor that was going down off the steps, mm -hmm. you know, down low, smart pastor by the way, if that was the pastor, it might have bought the lack of training and preparedness mm -hmm. had that happened that way, might have bought the bad guy enough time to run over and point blank execute that pastor. And I truly believe the pastor was, was the next intended victim. The, I mean, you don't pivot 120 de or 180 degrees just looking for a fresh target. He swept three quarters of the church body to aim at that stage. And so where I had bet in, my bet was he was intending to murder the pastor. And so if we honestly gut check ourselves and go, could I have drawn, gotten my weapon on, on target that fast? And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give some tough love and, and a painful, distasteful truth. This is a little pill of truth that's not going to taste very good. But if we don't ever dry fire practice, and if we don't ever mm -hmm. practice our draw stroke, and we don't ever practice shooting, the answer is no, emphatically no. I don't care if you are a combat-tested, double-dip, black, pajama, ninja, Navy SEAL, which is pretty close to what my one of my instructor friends says. I don't <laughs> care who you are. If you haven't practiced that in 30 years, you're not that good anymore. It's yeah. not like riding a bike. And that is a very uncomfortable truth. And, and, if it, and if it hurts somebody's feelings, I apologize. But I would much, much rather that it sting a little bit in this environment where it's spoken in love than get, it, than get a call from somebody saying, Mm -hmm. wow, um, I still didn't go practice, and we had a guy show up at our church, and he wanted to copycat the Texas shooter. And by the way, that happens. It could happen. And sure. he came in, and he opened fire, and I didn't have the skills. I'm going to bounce to one more thing, and then I'm going to throw it back to you. So the aftermath of this bad boy, and I know you've got thoughts on this, just because the bullet leaves the barrel and the bad guy falls down doesn't mean it's over. So not only um, – there's a lot of tough things that are going to follow this. I think, I forget how many folks he said attend that church. I think it was like 270 folks. So his church is actually bigger than the average church. Um, there's going to be years of counseling. There's going to be people that leave the church because of this. There's going to be people that join the church because of this. And, and I'm not going to say that those people are wrong or right for what they do. But there's, I have read things about shootings that happened 20 and 30 years ago, and like you're talking about that shooting in Texas, there was a woman that she actually admitted that the only place she's ever terrified is in her church. She has mm -hmm. a hard time sitting with her back to the door. And that's the last place that you should be terrified because you should have a well squared away safety team. Um, so th there's that, and then um, you're going to have people that need counseling, and, and, and it shouldn't be overlooked. You're going to have people to leave, and then that, there we go. And then you're going to have the potential for lawsuits. And this is one of these things where 
carrying insurance, which I believe you carry insurance and I carry insurance. Um, I use U.S. Law Shield. There's some other great companies out there. I just happen to like U.S. Law Shield. Imagine, imagine um, you are the hero of a situation like that and you get served a subpoena and you're being sued in civil court because the second cousin of the person that you had to shoot uh, has suffered emotional trauma and wants to sue you for $4 million. Um, I'm protected against that. You're protected against that. It doesn't mean it's not going to stink, but, and there may even be lawsuits and this is so hard for us to process within the church body. Sure. So there may be, there may be somebody that goes to that church and I pray in Jesus name that that does not happen. I do, but there may be lawsuits within that church. I, I really, one of these days need to sit down and, and see if I can dig up interesting things about Sutherland Springs and mm -hmm. see how many lawsuits actually have come about. It'd be an interesting, it'd be interesting thing for you and I to do, and then actually talk about it in a video. But um, and I'm just about out of steam, but I, I think it's kind of important to touch on this is the fight after the fight. And I know that a lot of the, the some of the different, you know, farms, uh, I don't want to say insurances, but the policy companies, sure. they actually use a slogan like that. Yeah. Um, but there is a fight after the fight and it's not just going to be emotional. And then this is one more reason, and I'm, I'm going to beat on that drum for a minute, what James is doing with trying to get groups all over the country to big churches to train with smaller churches, and the idea that we both love about cross-deputizing. Um, imagine that we had churches within an hour of each other. We've used this analogy before, but now instead of it being a disaster, um, maybe, God forbid, my church has had a shooting, and I call and say, you know, my people are just not up to this this Sunday. I've got I've got three guys that are like, nope. And all of a sudden, we need people. I know that there were um, three percenter, like straight up legitimate three percenter Oath Keepers that showed up to Sutherland Springs and, and watched the facility. I heard it was around the clock. Um, they had people patrolling the property, the grounds during services. That's mm -hmm. admirable. And if you have people that were squared away and you could call and say, hey, Paul, man, I... You know, the, the 83 people that are on my team, because we're not going to use a real number, the, the, <laughs> the, the huge amount of people that are on your team, hey, yeah. man, 40 of them are not going to be able to show. And I'm not sure how squared away the rest of them are going to be. And I borrow some of your guys. That's huge. Yeah. You know, to, to have that relationship. So I literally have exhausted my notes minus one small thing, which I want to add. And I'm going to throw it back to you, which is do you <laughs> exercise regularly? Have you watched the video of the guy that goes up over the pew to get into position? Um, there are people I know that couldn't have done that. Yeah. And I'm not saying that you can't For be in sure. safety if you don't have that level of mobility, but the floor was completely obstructed yeah. by, by uh, people that were trying to stay in a safe environment. And I admire that. But the guy looked around and went fine. And he went up over the pew to get closer so anyway, just just thoughts for everybody's <laughs> making New Year's resolutions. Stay in fit to protect our flock. So anyway, I am literally out of ammo. Well, let me let me just start off by saying that I'm so proud that uh, that of you that uh, you managed to squeeze in a Larry Bird uh, <laughs> Boston Celtics <laughs> analogy there. That was a slam dunk, <laughs> literally. Thank you. I, the only the only problem is that a third of our audience that's watching this probably has no clue who he is. I don't know. <laughs> you know, just just happened to be one of my my basketball heroes. <laughs> but um, no, I and, and, and you know we don't spend a, we don't ever spend a lot of time talking about. In all seriousness, we don't we don't often spend a lot of time talking about the aftermath, and you know the fact that. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, uh, Sunderland Springs in that situation, I mean, they're still, they had to tear their, they had to tear the building down and completely rebuild a new church building because it was so full yeah. of holes from, from that shooting. Um, the pastor's, the pastor's daughter died in that situation. And now, you know, he's on tour with, um, with Jimmy Meeks and, and Carl Chin, like he does a lot because he's so passionate about that, about um, getting other churches to wake up and say, Hey, this is, this is what's going on. But I can't imagine every time he stands on stage reliving 
that all over again. And, you know, what I find interesting is, and again, I'm going to, I'm going to refer back to the, this um, DHS um, table talk exercise and stuff. But one thing, one of the things that I really appreciate about that is that towards the end, it asks that question, you know, that's, that's one of the last key things. And it's like, Hey, talk about what are your resources for if this happens? Cause you have to realize that it doesn't end when the police tape is gone. And the fact that, you know, you will have individuals that don't, don't go to church anymore. You will have individuals that question their faith in, in God. You will have individuals that, um, ask the question, why, why did this happen to our church? Why did God allow this to happen to our church? And there's not always, there's not always a black and white answer for that. Um, You know, I've, and and I know you've been in situations being, being a chaplain. I've, I've stood next to people that just lost their, their entire home, you know, from a fire. And they're like, well, you know, where's, you know, where's, where's, and, and again, this is just a general question, but it's like, where's God now? You know, this just happened to me. This is amazing. And, you know, one of, one of the things in some of the, the training that I've gone through is that, you know, you're, you have to, to try and help people focus on the next thing. Like what's the next step, you know, let's get your family to the focusing on the next, the next thing. Um, and that's, you know, that's easier said than done. But one of the things that I appreciated with the DHS thing was realizing that if something happens to your church, the people that you would typically go to for counseling, like your pastor, um, probably aren't going to be available to counsel you because of, you know, things going on in the church or maybe counseling that that they need as individuals looking forward and saying, okay, um, you know, how, uh, I mean, honestly, how, how, how does the pastor feel, you know, when, when we look at that and we, and, and whether you have a safety team or not, that individual, you have a safety team and something happens. Okay. The, the pastor is going to feel a sense of responsibility for, you know, what happened and that weighs on them no different than the, than the responsibility of, um, you know, my, one of my pastors commented not too long ago, uh, to me in a conversation that, uh, he was extremely depressed because quite a few of the individuals that he was friends with that, um, go to our church had had, uh, marriage problems and marriage issues. And he, he had gotten to the point where he, he had to stop like personalizing it and being like, well, you know, it's, I feel like I could have done something. Well, you know, things happen, life happens. And just because it doesn't go the way that we think it should mean, doesn't mean that it's somebody's fault. Um, but, you know, in, in looking forward and planning or preparing for that, um, you know, I hope, I hope we never have to deal with that sort of thing, uh, at my church or, or any other church. I, I pray that that never happens, but the, the reality is that if, again, going back to the training and, and, um, looking at other situations, if we don't at least try to talk through and sit down and have, you know, an idea, Hey, this could happen to us. How would we handle it? Then, you know, it's, this is really, this whole situation is really a loss and, you know, we're not going to get as much for it, you know, from it. Now, that being said, um, we've had some few, a few people post questions and a few people, um, post comments in the group today. I think it was today about how, you know, they have, uh, one, one team mentioned that they, some members on their team don't want to watch the video. They don't want to see, see that i saw that and you know it's kind of a two-edged sword i understand the the video none of the videos that i've seen are graphic are that graphic let me say that it's not you know you don't see blood and guts i guess from the video but at the same time you know youtube pulled it because of the violence very quickly um if it wasn't for other news 
you know, news places and, and individuals re-releasing the video, um, you know, we probably wouldn't have the access to it that we, that we do. So I, I mean, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. The, the, the harsh reality is this is a ministry that you can go from one extreme to another very quickly. And, you know, even if you have individuals that aren't willing to watch it or to consider it, that doesn't mean that they're the wrong person for that ministry. Um, maybe God's gifted them in another area of that ministry. Um, but that is something yeah. you have to you have to think about and consider. Um, I know uh, the individuals that we have, uh, I'm, I'm the safety director at my church. I have uh, three other individuals. We're actually, I'm, we're trying to train a fourth individual. Um, but I know those four guys without a question in, in the back of my mind, I know their skill set. I know where they are. Um, and I know that if I went into a, a similar situation that, you know, they would have my back a hundred percent. And if I can't say that, you know, and again, and that's not just serving in ministry. I mean, we're all very good friends. That's just how it's become because we, we know that we have each other's backs. Um, it's very much like a brotherhood, like the, you know, I've never been in the military, but I know enough individuals that have, and, you know, including my dad and my brother and, and uh, several friends that I think are watching. But, you know, when I think about that, it is, you know, the ministry team, the safety ministry has to be kind of like a brotherhood because you're, you're passionate about doing what other people might not consider uh, doing, you know, at the end of the day. And so, you know, this, this individual, and, and again, remembering um, the safety team member that gave his life um, for that church shouldn't, shouldn't quickly be forgotten because, you know, this is quite possibly, and again, another first, but this is quite possibly the first time that, that that's ever happened for a church, that a safety team member actually, you know, was involved and, and ended up, um, you know, losing his life. And, you know, the, the interesting thing about safety team and in, in that ministry is that, you know, my oversight pastor and I talk about it all the time. And, and he, he kind of joking around usually comments and says, well, you know, you guys operate like a police department and, and you're very efficient and he's very complimentary and encouraging like that. Uh, but that's not a lie. I mean, we go from one, one extreme of, <laughs> you know, walking through the parking lot, uh, plunging a toilet to the next extreme of <laughs> not the toilet in the parking lot. I'm just saying <laughs> we get, we get pulled for all sorts of crazy things and, you know, one extreme to another. And it's like, okay, so we've got to have that focus and that mentality to be able to bounce back and forth, you know, with what's going on and, and that sort of thing. So I don't know. I just, um, we'll probably, probably wrap it up. I'm just looking through some of the comments real quick. Um, uh, one of the things, Ooh, we have to behave Paul because Michael's watching. I just want to throw that out there now. <laughs> um, one of the, one of the things that, um, has popped up before you mentioned, you, you touched a little bit on insurance and we've had, I've seen a lot of questions like that come about, um, and I've had a lot, a lot of churches reach out to me and say, well, how do we handle this um, with firearms and insurance and that sort of thing? So let me just throw this out there real quick and then and then we'll wrap it up. Um, but the, the most candid, the best conversation you, you can have from a safety team perspective is just call your insurance company. And I don't mean like ask the pastor or staff or whoever to call them just ask the pastor, say, hey, um, if you're not full-time staff, if, if you're not staff with that church, say, I've got a few questions. I, I'm the safety team person. Um, I'd like some very direct answers from, my, from the church insurance company. And um, if, <clears throat> if the, the staff or the leadership of the church says, no, we're not going to let you do that, that would kind of be a flag to me. 
um, because it should just be a simple, okay, here's our company, here's our policy, here's the number that, that you deal with. So call your insurance company and just ask them and say, hey, do you guys cover safety teams? Do you cover uh, use of lethal force or non-lethal force? What exactly do you cover? If, and, and you can be as blunt, and this is, this is what I've done with our insurance company, as blunt as if I carry a firearm on church property and someone comes in trying to take my life or, some, or the life of somebody else and I use that firearm, what, what is allowed, what is not, what do you cover, what do you not cover? Um, because I do, I carry now, I carry my own insurance policy. It's actually through, uh, same company. You have yours, uh, us law shield. And, uh, um, when I, when I reached out to our church insurance company and I started talking to them, they said, we are going to cover you first and foremost. We allow, uh, we allow safety teams to actually carry, lethal or non-lethal force to protect themselves. Um, and in the best interest of the church congregants, you know, that's, that's acceptable. So the, the church insurance, because of the insurance company that we have, and we have uh, insurance with Brotherhood Mutual, um, they were like, you know what? It, it doesn't matter. We cover it inside the building. Your personal insurance picks up where ours doesn't cover. And I said, well, where does yours not cover? And they said, nowhere. <laughs> they said, ours, ours, yeah. ours covers everything. So you don't have to worry about it. And then they said, you know, you don't need to worry. Um, that's not something you should be focused on. You know, that's something that we take care of. And, you know, great question, but um, rest assured you're taken care of. So usually, and again, that's, that's what I tell that that's what I'll tell churches. It's really not as intimidating as you think, um, but it is a it is a best practice. Just call them and just say, "Hey, what do you guys cover if this were to happen?" And trust me, their phone is your insurance agent. Their phone is ringing off the hook right now. If if they <laughs> if they cover churches in your general area, there is more than one church that's calling that's asking this question. Because in 24 hours, I think I, I received like five or six messages from churches from the West Coast to the East Coast saying, hey, how do I find out this? How do I handle this? And that's not a bad thing you're asking. So that's that's awesome. That's great. Um, but it's not as it's not as crazy of a question as you might think. And a lot of times if you call the insurance company and just be blunt with them and say, Hey, if this were to happen, if we were to have an active shooter, what would the coverage be? Like, what would you cover? Would you cover, you know, civil or criminal, you know, how, how does this work? How do you respond? Um, that gives a lot of peace of mind. And it also puts you in a place of knowing what's going on so that if another team member comes up to you and says, Hey, I have a question. What is, what is the church insurance? Are we allowed? Are we covered? Then, you know, you're able to directly answer that and say, yes, you are. Um, as long as you're, you know, using that, that instrument to protect yourself or someone else in the church. So definitely look into that. Um, you know, brotherhood doesn't sponsor this, <laughs> this, this, uh, Facebook live, but I can't, <laughs> I can't, uh, <clears throat> but they could, if they wanted to, there you go. I, uh, but I will tell you, honestly, um, that I, I couldn't be more impressed with them as a, as a company. Um, the safety conference that, that we did at our church in December, they helped sponsor. Um, and they, they were very pro making sure that everybody could understand and, and, um, and follow along with what's, what's going on. But, uh, you know, there's some insurance agents in our group that, uh, that serve also as in, in church safety teams. So if you have a question like that and it's more specific, uh, please feel free to post, you know, post that question and, you know, we'll, we'll try and get you, uh, get you in a direct, uh, direct contact with an individual that can help you out. But uh, a last, last thing about brotherhood and then I'll, I'll get off that soapbox. Um, if you do have brotherhood insurance uh, and you don't know the resources that they offer, shame on you. 
and that's that's my bitter pill uh, for the day because um honestly they have so many resources they have a website with videos for safety teams they have policies they have procedures and if you're a member if your church is a member of their insurance company all of that is free f r e e <laughs> so seriously take advantage of that and um spend some time looking through all of that and um that's pretty much it anything else you want to add sir yeah i want to jump in really quick because i you you brought up a great topic which was knowing like somebody doesn't want to watch the video would they have your back um developing a relationship with people that goes beyond serving mm -hmm. together on sunday and really getting to know people is is useful. Um, I had a friend give me one of the greatest compliments that I've ever received in my life. And somebody said, well, who's that? And he said, that's Paul Buckner. And he said, I don't know a better way to describe him than to tell you that he was helping me move. My, my friend owns a company. Uh, he's my coffee company buddy. And uh, you know of him. And um, we were, I was helping him move from one, one side of town to the other. And we'd only known each other for a few weeks. And he comes back to his house and his door is open. And he looks at me, and I saw the blood drain from his face. Um, great guy. He's a veteran, and he's about, he's about the best friend you could ask for. And, um, and without a word, we nodded, drew our sidearms, and cleared the house. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't even know Paul that well, but he had my back. And I don't know how to tell you. He said he's a Christian man, and he's like, he would do anything for you. And I say that not to not to make me sound good, but what I say that is I know people like that, and I know you well enough to know, and there's other people in this group that I know in person and I've just met through this group, that I know that that's their heart. They're a sheepdog. And I had a, I had a situation recently where two Christian brothers that I dearly love, I'm their chaplain, and they came into such a strong disagreement that as Christian brothers, they almost came to blows. And these two men are are, would be like bulls fighting. I mean, they're, they're both ex-military, they're both huge men, and they dearly love God, but they came to such a loggerhead disagreement, it almost came to blows. And separately, I was counseling both of these men, and I said, I gotta ask you a question. I said, if right now, so I'm talking to this guy, I told you that this guy had people coming to his house to try to kill him, what would you do? And he said, I would be there in a heartbeat, and I would fight to the death for him. And both men said that. There is a place for the Christian warrior. And there, there's a place for the Christian sheepdog to protect his flock. And we know each other. And, and, and we know each other. And if we build these relationships that go beyond just seeing each other on Sunday mornings, and we're, we're in each other's lives, and, and it's spiritual too. We're there to be with each other spiritually. That's huge. And I, I had a law enforcement buddy turn to me recently, and he said, there was a situation. Um, it got out of hand. There was a guy that was probably armed, a whole bunch of cops. And I was handed a weapon and told, protect this guy. So I was backing up a young officer, wife, kids, and there was a situation where the officer had to make a decision between running after the bad guy across the open when he could potentially get shot and, uh, and remaining by cover with me watching his back. Mm -hmm. And one of the officers that was there later, who is, my, who is like my little brother, turned to me and he goes, you know the difference between him with you and me with you and i said what's that and he said i wouldn't have hesitated because i would have known you would have had my back and that's what we're called to i say that again not to make me sound good it's the brotherhood that you're talking about to know that these people have your back and you know it's one of those things where um when you've got it you've got it and i've had people that didn't have any sheepdog that i had to stand down from my team and um, I think that there's probably people all over the country right now that are gut checking themselves and going, would I have had the ability, not necessarily to make the shot, but would I have been able to run towards the sound of the guns? And that's the thing we got to think about and pray about. Um, and there's a thought in there somewhere. We need to be praying for each other on our church safety teams, and we need to know our church safety team members, again, just to beat on that one more time. We need to know each other. You know your church safety team outside of church. You guys have each other's numbers, you guys talk through Messenger, and you guys do more than just come together on Sundays and Wednesdays or whatever. And that is that is huge because a man will die for his brother, but a lot fewer people will die for a stranger. And I guess mm -hmm. if, if I could put a, um, 
Um, yeah, Michael, I think I think you would. I agree. Um, he was saying that he would have my back, basically, and I, I agree. I think he would. But <laughs> the, we need to invest back into our teams, and we need to build that sure. level of camaraderie. And um, because because you're much less likely to die for a stranger than you are for somebody you love. And mm -hmm. I guarantee you there's people that I know that I would go, I would be there to help them if something happened because I care about them that much. So anyway, somewhere in there was a thought. I think I'm getting kind of tired. And he, he <laughs> says that he might even do it for you, James. No, that's not what he said. He said oh, wow. same for James. So he, he said same for James. I was, I was editing for content. So anyway, I'm going to hand it back to you. Editing for content. Yeah, okay. I work for CNN. I mean, I um, I work for a, a news outlet. I, uh, I'm i taking back my comments to you on Larry Bird. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> no. And, you have yeah. been unfriended by James. Yeah. <laughs> Boop. <laughs> you know, that's really what you said, though, is is really the truth of it. And, and, and if we're not, and I can't say that enough, if we're not investing in individuals and, and it's again, it's it's discipleship. You know, we've had we've said that before. We've we've had that conversation. If we're not investing in the individuals that or trying to uh, invest in the individuals that are serving with us, then, you know, as leadership, um, you know, we're, we're going to be at a loss. There is, there's going to be a disconnect there between someone mm -hmm. wanting to do something for you and someone willing, um, willing to do something. And yeah, Jim, <laughs> Jim, Jim's awesome. He stays up late every night or every week, every weeknight weekend night watching watching us um him and his wife so but you know the the reality though is i mean there's so much there it's it's like a um i look at it as kind of like a, a small group or a life group and if you don't have that mentality or or the ideology of you know, it's just a ministry. It's just a team that you're leading or you're in charge and you're directing. It really tends to come across as, I think, um, just from my experience, it, it comes across as like a bull in a china shop. And it's like, okay, you know, you're trying to fit a, a square peg in a round hole and you just don't, you don't mesh. And the, the times where I've had individuals that have served with me, that we we came to an agreement that maybe that wasn't the right fit um, for being involved in the safety team. You know, it was me trying to shove, okay, I think you should do this because this is what your resume says, not, you know, in serving in the <laughs> serving in the in this ministry. Well, I think because you have a security background that you should serve on the safety team. Well, maybe not. Maybe God's calling them to do something else. And, you know, I think as leadership, we also we need to be open to that and at least listening. And and that's one of the things that that I, I mentioned on another thread. I think it was yesterday or, or might have been today. And that's that, you know, your team fluctuates. It goes up and it goes down. Um, you know, when I started, when we started the idea 10 years ago of a safety team, um, we put a requirement in that somebody would have to serve for at least six months because of the training. Um, you know, when I look back and I look at all the individuals that serve with me right now, um, you know, most of those individuals have been with us or with me since the, the very beginning of that. And when I look at that and I'm like, you know, we're talking seven or eight years that these folks have been actively serving Never once have I had to go back to them and say, okay, you know, I, you promised six months. Now, I mean, things come up, people's, people's you know, uh, visions change, people's goals change for where they want to serve in the church. And that's fine. That, that's understandable. But at the end of the day, you know, a, a lot of or a little bit of patience goes a long way. And, uh, you know, we all have bad days. I'm, I'm very thankful and very grateful that um, the folks that I have are more, you know, the folks that I serve with are more than just somebody serving. You know, I, I look at them as 
uh, you know, close friends and, and, uh, we're all, we're all in it together and we're all, we're all serving for the same, the same reason and the same thing. So I don't know, but I think that's, I think that's key. Um, so for those of you that are struggling with that right now, um, you know, I would, I would just say, hang in there and just realize that, um, you know, there, the numbers come and go, you know, for a long time, based on our membership, um, statistically, you know, my church is actually low for how many people that we have serve. And then I think back and think to the old adage that, you know, 20% do 80% of 20% in ministry do 80% of, of the job. And it's like, well, oh, you guys had 20% yeah. that did that. I think ours <laughs> was like 2% did 98% of the job. <laughs> yeah. So, you know what, but I will, I will tell you that with a core group of people, I don't look, I'm not as actively looking for folks. I mean, I, I will talk to them. Um, and you know new new individuals occasionally new individuals that come to the church i've had a, an opportunity to talk to and that sort of thing um but i think to a certain extent i think if you trust your 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 people skills and trust your gut i think you'll know if somebody's a good fit for that role or not um because you know in the back of your mind just by having a, a general conversation I, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll ask other safety team members to, you know, or other leaders to, to chat with them and, and just say, Hey, what did you think from that conversation? But I don't know. I mean, it is, it is what it is, but let's, I want to uh, add one little quick thought. And then I think you were going to exit in prayer and I'm going to make this really quick. Cause we've been at it almost two hours. Um, I was really sitting here prayerfully thinking because what you said about about discipleship is exactly what I was trying to find. I was trying to find that word. And I just, the best way to have brothers in Christ is to be a brother in Christ. And that that's that may sound like an overly oversimplification, oversimplification, but it's not. And you and I both strive to be transparent. And that transparency is huge. When you are willing to turn to another man and say, these are places I've struggled. These are things I need prayed about. Um, and, and you don't put on airs, which is what our culture wants us to do is put this facade and be like, no, everything's great. And you're actually going, I've been shot. It, you know, that's terrible. We, we put it on this facade and act like everything's perfect. But the best way to create a brotherhood is to be a brother. And I've had people turn to me and be like, man, I can tell you, I can tell you anything I'm struggling with and you'll have a word of advice and you'll pray with me. And I am far from perfect, just ask my wife, but I, I try really, really hard to be a brother in Christ and to build a brotherhood with other people. So I know you get, I know you get exactly what I mean. Oh, absolutely. And, and I agree. I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's, I don't know. I just, I look at it and to me, it's kind of like, you know, we're, I don't know. We, we're all working on this together. I mean, I don't, I don't look at myself as really, or I try not to look at myself as, as any different than anybody else. I have a different skill set, but again, that's, that's biblical. I mean, that's the, the body of Christ. Everybody, everyone has a, has talents and everyone has, you know, things that they're better at and some things than others. I mean, I've had situations where I've had to deal with the, the media in our church and you know that the guys that i work with or guys and gals are like i am so thankful that that's on you and not me because you know that's not what i'm skilled in or like a lot of times when i go to, and talk to one of the pastors about something they're like oh you're mr tactful and you're mr pr you know and all this and i'm like i you know it's because i don't walk into their office with a shotgun and i'm not like give me <laughs> increase this budget or else or i want a camera or else although yeah. my current oversight pastor might say that i nag him too much i don't know i i a lot of times i operate on the the greasy wheel principle <laughs> You just said something that I think bears talking about, and I would like you to talk about that if you're willing, if, if you don't want to just, you know, maybe do that another time. But I think today would be the time. 
there's a time and a place to talk to the media, and that's going to be a big topic based on this situation. And, and I want to handle that tastefully, um, but there's a time and place to talk to the media, and there's a time not to talk to the media. And I would be the worst person after a shooting to talk to the media <laughs> because I would be like, <laughs> and I would just say way too much stuff, and I would need a lawyer standing next to me going, and here's a prepared statement. I mean, that I would be that guy. I would be the literally. I would be the worst person to be the spokesperson for a church after something bad happening. So I'm, hold, I'm holding up cue cards here for you. <laughs> now, yes, and, and that's, exactly. that's absolutely that's absolutely true. If something happens, regardless, um, there needs to be one individual that's involved in the situation that communicates with the pastors. Okay, um, after the fact, after everything is done. If, if other individuals want to go talk to the pastor about what happened, and I'm talking here, I'm talking about minor stuff, but you know, when you have a congregation, regardless of the size, Sunday is precious to pastors. Okay. So when I go up to, to my pastor, if I need to talk to him, I'll say, Hey, can I schedule some time with you this week to sit down maybe over a cup of coffee or grab, grab some lunch or something like that? Because I need to talk to you about some stuff, but it's not, life-threatening, urgent, but I can't talk to you right now because you've got, you know, 800 people pulling on you or a thousand people pulling on you right now. That's just not possible. So a lot of times now, I, I when something happens, I'm the one that usually goes and, do, and briefs the oversight pastor, or if he's not available, I'll talk to one of the other pastors. But um, typically, when anything happens, if it's non-life-threatening, non-emergent, um, I will go and I will tell them what's going on. If it is serious or it's something that I'm involved in, I will not talk to the media. Um, I will ask, and and my oversight pastor now is um, is actually deputy sheriff, uh, but I will go to him and we'll talk about it. And he'll say, well, what do you think I should say? And, and that's the relationship we have. We'll go back and forth. And then he's, he's had, you know, I've had experience with that. He's had 10 times the experience with that. And so for me to defer to him now, the only time that I will go and address the media is if a pastor is preaching or if something happened and they're not available. And my, my default um, conversation is, Hey, uh, so-and-so, you know, and, and as, as much as, as much as the junk that we give the media for being uncaring people like <clears throat> CNN and, and places like that, um, you know, the reality is they're people too. They're just trying to do their job. And so I have never had someone step past me to say, well, I'm going to go talk to this, this pastor anyway, because he's preaching right now. So a lot of times our default phrase is, if you would like a statement from a pastor, um, we just ask that you would wait until the service is done or the pastor can meet you, you know, meet with you in a better time or at a better time. But that's something that we've talked about beforehand, and all of the pastors are comfortable with that. Some of them have talked to the media, some have not. And so for us, um, that's a conversation we we were thrown in abruptly because we had something happen at our church that uh, the police department decided that they were going to try and make an example of to the community. And so the police department released a press statement to uh, without forewarning us to the media that this particular incident happened. And so all of a sudden we've got the media knocking on our door saying, well, this happened this past Sunday, what's going on? And so, and that was fine. They had the rights to do that. I, I understand I'm not upset at them or anything like that, but it put us down a road that we were like, you know what, we need to have this conversation because uh, that particular day, all of the pastors were out of town and it was the secretary, you know, the secretary called me and very, very sweet, uh, dear lady. And she's been with the church forever for probably 40 plus years. She called me and she's like, there's, there's a newscaster here and they want to talk to somebody. What should I say? What should I do? And, um, you know, it's, it's hard. It really is. But, 
you know, we were, we were kind of christened, christened by fire and, and basically said, um, you know, here's, here's the thing. This is what, you know, this is where we're at and whatnot. Um, somebody just popped up the question, uh, dealing, do you have policies on giving statements to law enforcement after a critical incident? So usually what we do, um, giving statements when we would give a statement, if the statement is necessary, um, is, you know, that's something where, uh, I'll sit down with the oversight pastor or one of the senior pastors and we'll kind of talk about it together. Um, and decide. I don't worry about that too much um, as far as giving a statement um, because our our pastors are very well spoken um, and they they handle situations and I've seen them handle situations like that uh, frequently. But um, I trust what they would say with or without me. And a lot of times, like one of the pastors might call me and say, hey, this is what I was going to tell them. What do you think? Is this OK? And, and there have been times where I've said, eh, I would change that. I would I would be a little more general, just say this or that. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, the media is going to say what the media wants to say, and they're going to split it up or edit it the way they want to edit it. Um, and you know, even even right now with white settlement and, and Mr. Wilson, you know, it, yeah, absolutely. Somebody just posted. Uh, I was surprised that he gave a testament or statement so early. You know what? Paul and I both. I mean, you could have knocked us over with a feather. Uh, but so much now uh, today happens because of social media. And so my guess is that they probably wanted to try and get in front of it uh, before the media actually got a hold of it and kind of blew it up. And I've already seen some bad um, kind of bad articles and stuff from the left saying, well, he had a gun in church and why should you have to have a gun in church? And that's not necessary. And all the political stuff I really don't want to get into, but yeah, we were, we were completely blown away that the statement came that early. Um, but I will say that, you know, you, that is, that is one thing, just like calling your insurance company, that's one thing that you need to have a conversation with your, with your church. If you're the safety team leader uh, or safety leader to say, okay, you know, in this type of situation, if I'm handling this, who, who's the best person to have this conversation? Who's the best person out of all of us to make the statement? I know that um, I would probably call the insurance company or call an attorney before um, I released a statement if it was like a shooting or something like that. But I also know you have to, to a certain extent, the mindset that you would use with the media, you also have to use with the individuals in your church. And the reason I say that is because not everything that happens in the church is public information and public knowledge. Um, you know, and, and coming up in your mind with a statement to say, when somebody walks up to you and says, well, why is there a police car out there? Uh, well, you know what? That's not really necessarily their business. Um, I mean, you can give a, a kind of generic, non-candid response or answer. Um, and I'm not saying lie to them or anything like that. But, you know, if I, if I told you 80% or 50% of the things that happened uh, in the last six or seven years, and I know, you know, from, from knowing Paul, he could say the same thing. You might not go back to church again. <laughs> and so a lot of, a lot of things like that, I mean, in all seriousness, it's better to have the question ahead of time or to think, you know, and, and if it's a medical, a medical incident or something like that, a lot of times those people don't want that information shared or that information you know, known, and it's awkward and embarrassing. Yeah. I had, um, I think it was a year or two ago, I had an usher collapse on me where I started to, to do CPR or try to do CPR on him. And I had a wall of people uh, around me to give us privacy. And I had safety team members dismissing church. It was right before church ended. I had safety team members dismissing out a different door so that we wouldn't have people coming out and looking and, and, we would have a little bit more privacy, but you know, you have to realize with HIPAA and everything else that 
you do have an obligation, you do have a responsibility to protect personal information and make sure that, you know, you're not giving away information that um, maybe would be offensive to someone or they might find out, oh, hey, you told somebody that, you know, I went to the hospital. Why'd you do that? It's it's hard um, and it's hard keeping. I'm not going to lie. It's hard keeping a lid on different things like that. I mean, I've had situations come up and maybe I'll get into them on another in another evening. Um, but I've had situations come up where a relative came up to me and got mad at me and in my face because I had been dealing with two parents or two sets of parents um, for a guy and a gal. And he was mad that I didn't come to him and got in my face. And I'm like, it's not really about you. It's about these two minors and their parents. So, you know, if you, you know, you always have to think on the fly. You always have to, to think, you know, less is more. Uh, but just keep in mind that, um, you know, not making a statement right away or stepping back and saying, you know what, I need a little bit of time to think through what happened and recollect my thoughts because I can tell you when I had to do uh, CPR on the usher that collapsed on me, there's stuff that happened in that seven or eight minute window before the ambulance pulled up that I don't remember. Like literally because my adrenaline was going and I was so focused that I, I, I have had team members come up to me and say, well, you were kind of mean to me. You were, you know, or you did this or you did that. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I don't honestly remember because I was so focused in doing that. So it's hard for, you know, it'd be hard for you to expect that you're going to give a coherent statement. Um, yeah. Stop laughing at me, Paul. <laughs> it's hard for me to think that you would have a, be able to give a coherent statement with, you know, with your adrenaline running. And, no, and that, that, I wasn't laughing. I was agreeing because <laughs> I would be the one. Oh my goodness. All right. Let's go ahead. And, <laughs> let's, let's go ahead and close in prayer. So is there much lag right now? There is. Yeah. <laughs> there's a, there's quite a bit of lag. You need to you need to go back to. Oh, so I want I wanted to make a quick comment and then I'm going to let you close in prayer. It's about four seconds, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> What's your comment? Okay, I'm going to make a really quick comment and then let you close in prayer because bad guys are going to watch the news, and if somebody sticks a microphone in front of the church member and they say um they say um hey uh how many people are on your church safety team oh eight thank you well now bad guys are now bad guys know or um they have actually had incidents where bad guys have um has actual they've actually studied other mass shootings mm -hmm. in order to make themselves better for the one they want to perpetrate and that's heartbreaking. So understand when we pull the roof off and we look into this church and we're watching this video, we're not the only people doing this. And so what we talk about to the press, we should be really careful with what we're letting out there because, and, and that's part of why this group is private. That's part of why this is so secret. That's part of why we're so careful. And we don't just broadcast this stuff to the world. Is there stuff we talk about in here that bad guys shouldn't know? So anyway, in four seconds, this is going to catch up and James is going to be able to pray. One, two, three, four. <laughs> I'll give you your, your four seconds. It's, it's buffering. Paul's buffering. All right, so let's go ahead and we'll we'll close in prayer. You'll you'll see me with my eyes closed and my head bowed, and then you'll know that I'm praying. All right. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity we've had the last couple hours to to just talk uh, about church safety and security. I ask that you uh, would put your hand of protection around uh, those churches listening and, and even those that aren't listening. 
Lord, I just ask that you would uh, place a hedge of protection around them. Give us the wisdom that we need uh, to serve you and to do things the way that you would have us do. And uh, be with us tonight and just be with us uh, this weekend as well as we come into uh, a new year, come into a new Sunday, uh, and give give the folks that are coming to church a peace of mind knowing uh, that uh, you're, you're with us and you're going to help us watch out and take care of them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I will go ahead and wait the four seconds and then because I'm pretty sure that Paul's still praying and then we'll go ahead and and cut it. All right, you guys have a good night. Thanks for hanging with us and uh, and be blessed. Take care.